Sebastian Cupido from the University of Applied Sciences. Is that right? Yes. In Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, and the title of his talk is Practical and Rational Freedom, the Politics of Private Life. Okay. Well, um, I first would like to thank everybody for inviting me for uh, because I I will explain it also a little bit later. I tend to work a lot by myself, and I'm not in uh, an institution that is really supportive in any philosophical research, <laughs> because it's basically a business school, which has some uh, advantages sometimes, but also some disadvantages. So um, what I will try to do, I would read some parts of the paper that uh, I have prepared, but sometimes I will also more go into discussion or just explain some things how I wanted to tell you this, also to make sure that everybody stays awake because it's the last lecture and can imagine that everybody's tired. <laughs> I am, at least. So, I want to start with this uh, small um, allegory and it actually it really links in what uh, Ronald has earlier told us about this neo-liberal paradigm that is really forcing itself into every nook and granny of our lives and this is a sort of way to ridicule the paradigm. One, a bedtime story. Once upon a time, there lived an evil prince called Bani and an evil princess called Bobby. Bobby and Bani ruled a small country quite similar to our own. Bobby's and Bani's evil was not the result of a longing for the creation of mischief and malice. It rather was the result of their ignorance and lack of character. For whatever the directions the wind of popular consent would blow, Bobby and Bani would dangle along with it with the brightness and sincerity of a national flag. Bobby was a joyful man in his late forties. He was not smart, loved football, at least this year, and he was intelligent enough to maintain the rule over his country. And Bonnie was rather pretty, blonde and smart, and smart enough to run a lucrative entertainment business, a business that she was able to start due to her rather vulgar beauty, a tool of which she was by all means very aware of. Most people, especially the poor and the privileged, adored her. The poor and the privileged founded 89% of the country's populace, and Wabi and Bani accepted that only a few of them would live in abject poverty. The rest was poor by default. Some of them had incurred a heavy loan from the state to foster their education, and those who were capable to do so also borrowed high sums of money from the kings to finance their own house or car. Others simply incurred debts to purchase socially accepted goods and services. And almost none of them would be able to pay back these debts within their lifetime. Furthermore, almost half of the wages of the poor and the privileged were contributed to the state and the kings. Now, this little allegory is, becomes much more closer to the reality in the Netherlands. And now I want to look up in some uh, I think with uh, Ronald earlier said from, well, what, what disappeared at least from, I can see from my country in the Netherlands, what was there when I was about 18 or 19 years old which is now lost and one thing that I see disappearing is that the government is um, socializing the, the people uh, to take over its own task. So, for example, now in our neighborhood there is a program in which the people are now asked to clean the neighborhood themselves because the government cannot do it. But also they've taken away a lot of uh, social infrastructure. For example, we have all kinds of playgrounds with um, people who are playing a little bit and looking after the children. And there are a lot of children who are being just put into the playgrounds by their parents and the parents go to the bar or do something else. And they have a very important role. But all these... Um, these kind of little things they start disappearing. And furthermore, what I saw also I think is a very important thing to realize, and I don't know whether this is the same in the United Kingdom or in other countries, is that when I was about 12 or 15 or 16, um, there was enough space to do things spontaneously in public life. So you would not have police immediately um, in a public park if you would start jamming with a band. And it, that was, it was fully accepted. If I would do this now in the Netherlands, I would fi be fined immediately. The same as public uh, uh, drinking. As you do it a little bit normal and you're not making a row, you're just enjoying yourself. These are all small things and they seem to be disappearing by over-regulation. Uh, this is, I think, uh, to make a short 
how the empire of Bobby and Bonnie is working. And the worst thing is that if you ask this, or you tell this to younger generations or to people who are living in our society, they do not really seem to mind. Because they're saying, well, yeah, but we need order uh, on, on the street. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, <laughs> we will have chaos. So, it was a small thing. Um, now, the, the, and the reason why I started with this allegory is that I want to show that which misunderstandings then would arise in a society similar to that of Bobby and Bonnie's kingdom of unconscious evil, and that such a misunderstandings are inevitable for every society that commits itself to the liberal idea of democracy, free market capitalism, and the rule of law. That is, a political ideology in which freedom as a doctrine plays a pivotal role but has lost its essential meaning as practice. The reason for this is clear. Freedom as a doctrine has been disconnected from conduct in such a way that a wide variety of practices can be explained uh, as acts of freedom. And this also illustrated a small example. Last time I was uh, on the airport and there was a woman walking around with a big t-shirt which says, no rules, no limits. This is a sort of allegory again for what people now consider freedom. But if this, that becomes freedom, that you can do everything you want always, irrespectively of what happens, then freedom loses meaning, it's being disconnected from practice. Now the position which I will take in doing this research is uh, not of a philosopher, but, or a scientist, but that of a well-informed uh, observer or hunter, uh, that takes freedom seriously. And this is as a consequence uh, that the research methodology that I use is that of an engaged spectator, who tries to understand the world by means of interactive dialogue with the environment of which he or she is a part. Just picking up a piece there, throwing a stone here, and marking the grounds for further inspection. And this also allows me to use a certain freedom of expression in the sense that I may use any type of style and form that is appropriate and functional to express what needs to be said or showed. Consider here a lost Indian marking his face with Chogarol, accepting that he has no obligation towards any political institution other than his own vibe, family or tribe. Thus, to the people who he deeply loves and who mean the whole world, world to him. Now, this disposition of the observer or hunter that takes freedom seriously is well illustrated or maybe better relatedly exposed in the autobiographical novels like Albert Camus' early work, L'Enfant et l'Etoile, and his later unfinished in Home. And in similar sort of disposition, I think we can find in Sartre's Le Carnet de la Toile de Guerre, or to draw the boundaries a little bit further, in George Orwell's Hommage to Catalonia, and Alexis de Tocqueville's Souvenirs, or what I find also a very interesting philosopher in relation to existentialism is uh, Michael Oakeshott who is actually an Anglo-American philosopher, and he wrote a very few beautiful essay on being conservative. And I will try to, uh, I quote my call short here, short to elicit any further what I will try to do in this essay. And I, Michael Ocho tries there, this is, my theme is not a greed or a doctrine, but a disposition. And my design here is to construe this disposition as it appears in contemporary character, rather than to transpose it into the ideal general principles. So uh, what I further would like to do is rather that if you take freedom seriously, um, that demands of a character to take in a certain disposition in which you act in accordance with the world. Yeah. Now, the first step that needs to be acknowledged for this is that one has a choice under all circumstances. And thus those who have taken freedom seriously must understand that freedom in its essence is absolute. So if you fully agree with Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre says, in every uh, position, you have a choice. So, um, and with this acknowledgement, one has accepted that one bears the full responsibility for the character that he or she is creating. Um, furthermore, we have to acknowledge that there is no universal explanation of human life, and that the whole endeavor by itself is absurd. Taking freedom seriously means that one has learned understanding that one's own world may be radically different from the world of every other individual, which has as a consequence that the basic state of our being is one of fundamental loneliness. 
To illustrate this point, I would like to quote here a part from the introduction of L'Enfer et l'Antoine from Howard Camus. Because I think Howard Camus picks out a, a painful part in this very nice. Uh, although the great gift, gift that I have in relation to this matter, I understand that it's impossible to be content with oneself. Something like a fundamental loneliness could exist. What I do not know, and we occasionally should have the right to dream of it, as if it were a paradise. Sometimes, like all others, I dream of it myself. But two quiet angels have denied my admission. One shows me the countenance of a friend, the other of a foe. Yes, I know it all, and I have also learned to understand, at least almost, how dear love is to be paid. No, what I think that Camille shows here is that <clears throat> if you could fully distangle yourself from any social relation, there is a certain quietness uh, which you can reach by consciousness. Maybe some monks are able to reach its quietness from consciousness by meditation, for example. Um, but as soon as you start engaging in social relationships, you meet social relationships that are either uh, positive for your freedom or they are either <coughs> negative for, for your freedom. And so it, there can, it automatically relates into a conflict because we simply cannot have an overall understanding of what human life is, at least not from, I believe, Sartre's ontology and also Albert Camus' way of thinking about what freedom consists of. Now this may explain the common characteristic of her disposition that one refrains from judgment. Although there may arise certain circumstances that do demand that one engages in uh, he or herself into an action, because it becomes instantly clear that such a situation does not allow such refrainment, this disposition to refrain from judgment, to transcend our thoughts or actions, is important because it enables us to understand the situation in a different manner than we have perceived it before. This possibility of transcendence is therefore a crucial learning mechanism that empowers us to get a grip on the world, and this attitude can be characterized as an attitude of benevolence. And benevolence for the observer means that he or she contemplates the world as a functional environment from which both the systematic and particular information can be drawn. And this enables him or her to make certain predictions of his or her own actions or the actions of others, uh, taken however that such predictions are by all means contingent. But benevolence also facilitates a relation to any other human being that leaves enough space for the other to appear as he or she wants to appear. In other words, benevolence is the best possible mode of the human to respect the freedom and dignity of both ourselves and the others. And benevolence for the hunter has a similar but also different meaning. And benevolence here means that we may at times decide not to kill, but we can be murdered and thus it opens the possibility for emp uh, empathy and forgiveness. And so what I try to say here, and I basically got this concept from uh, Japanese uh, ethical thought, especially from the Hagakure, and which is a, um, a handbook on ethical behavior for the samurai, is that the basic notion of the samurai is that he tries to refrain from judgment because this enables him to see who the enemy truly is. And most of the time, then there is no reason for a conflict, because the enemy seems not to be the enemy. So if you take freedom seriously, that we cannot know what uh, good human life is, and we cannot judge about this, then this may be appropriate disposition to take in relation to others, also for strategic reasons. And the consequence for the disposition that I have to set out here is that we may say that during our lifetime we find ourselves in a continuous struggle between accepting and refusing. And to state it in a different manner, the human condition is one of consolidation and revolt. And to keep and to do away, to love and to let go, and such choices are often imposed upon us by forces that go far beyond the level of individual control, and in many cases, the solution if there is any, is a tragic one. And so what we find ourselves in is that although we may take a benevolent position, we do need to make choices on 
how we go on or how we will not go on, what we tend to want to keep or what we not will tend to keep. And this leads us in a continuous situation of uh, consolidating things which we may have or uh, annihilating things which we do not want to have anymore. And so that's the second basic function. Now, if we consider that um, if we take the particular uh, disposition seriously, I think then we get to a point where we can talk about uh, two different types of freedom um, which we need to act in the world. And I think the first type of freedom would be our rational freedom, and the second type of freedom will be our practical freedom. Because basically we need to act within the world, but as soon as we take a certain action, we can transcend from that action and then give it a new cognitive function or meaning. So we can learn how to rephrase our actions or to steer our behavior in the world. Now, this part I would like to make then a step. Uh, if we have to educate other people, uh, what particular values or what particular skills should be learned then? to uh, the younger generations. And it also support our both our rational and practical freedom. And here then I would like to first uh, do <coughs> the little schedule of Michael Oksh of sorry, of <coughs> Lawrence Goldberg. This, uh, this one. Is, does anybody know the, the uh, research of Lawrence Goldberg? Is familiar with some now, Lars Goldberg, he did a lot of research on the moral development of uh, people, and he did that research on a universal level, in the sense that he did it in several countries. And what Lars Goldberg basically has found out is that uh, if people want to learn how they can improve, in the sense, their rational moral thoughts, is that it always goes to different uh, stages of development. But basically, with children, it means that they start at stage one, in which they act according to uh, punishment and obedience. <coughs> and what that will lead to punishment is wrong. And before they can get to a higher stage, uh, they first have to go to stage two, stage three, and stage four. Now, I think that we have uh, a problem from the perspective that we have taken in that we can say, okay, but who says that Goldberg's model has any value? Uh, this is a position which you can take, I think, from a set, uh, searching point of view, uh, because we can also deny the value of Goldberg's theory. But on the other hand, we can also think, well, we can try this in practice and see where it works if we take freedom seriously. Well, it doesn't really matter, because then you get into a sort of continuous uh, criticism against the model of Goldberg, and if it works, then we keep it. So, it's a more a pragmatic way to do it. Now, I think the second theory, which is very important in relation to um, uh, the development of our rational and practical freedom, uh, is the theory which is uh, written by Axel Honneth, and it's called the Struggle for Recognition. What Axel Hamlet shows in the struggle for recognition is that um, if we want to develop a certain form of self-esteem and self-respect, uh, then we can only develop this if we have been recognized in our uh, self-esteem and self-respect by significant others. If you take away <coughs> a laugh from very young children and you do not recognize them uh, as a child, then they start soon to, uh, to develop certain mental effects. They become very narcissistic, or they become very obedient. Of course, we can still say an obedient character or uh, a narcissistic character is a free character, but then we do end up a little bit again in the logic of society of body and body, we say everything can be free. This, it does not really make sense in a way. You cannot really prove that it does not really make sense, but in some other way, you can argue that it does. Mm. Mm. So, in relation to practical rational freedom, I think if you want to engage in a project or in a praxis, you at least, at least have to need some self-esteem and you would also need to have a zone of value of your own uh, behavior. 
The third theory I think is very interesting in relation to this is the theory of Albert Bandura. He's a, also a sociolo sociologist. And Albert Bandura shows us that a lot of behavior um, is based on the fact that people do what they think that they can do. So, if you have a cognitive idea of yourself that you are able to do a certain thing, uh, then you would certainly act according to that. But if you have an idea that you're not able to do something, uh, then you would leave it. And so you do not act according to that. Now, if we take these three basic theories as a way to look at how we develop our rational and uh, practical freedom, then it becomes more or less clear how you could design um, an educational model that would foster freedom in a practical and rational sense. And basically, it means from Colbert's perspective that you should look uh, at children, see how they are acting, and if they <coughs> act according to a certain rule, then you may ask the children, for example, from a Socratic point of view, why are you doing this? And as soon as you get a disconnection uh, between the explanation of the child and his behavior, the child is able to grow within these stages, which means he's able to make more abstract rational thoughts. Yeah, but this, you'll, you can only do this on a very small particular level. Now, our current educational system is not based on that level. Uh, we have classrooms with 30, sometimes uh, 25, but there are also very large classrooms and there is no um, possibility to teach children in that particular way. And this has as consequence that the only thing that you can teach in the classroom is the current knowledge that is within the liberal paradigm. So they simply take it over. <coughs> the thing which you see a lot of uh, in education in the Netherlands is that there's a lot of testing by the state itself. They call this a CETO test. And it simply uh, tests the level that the child has according to the government testing methods. But this CETO test, test works as a very powerful mechanism to uh, make distinction between certain children. It distincts the children, in fact, that speak the Dutch language quite well because they can read the assignment well and they can give the right answers. And this already puts on a very young age a very uh, hard class distinction within the school class. And Carmina uh, and I have also had discussions as parents um, whether we like it that uh, our own daughter is because of the CETA test in one of these excellent classes. Because actually we think the system really sucks. But you're not going to tell your daughter, sorry, you're in a class that <laughs> we think should not exist. And this is what I uh, said in also in the uh, abstract that I sent, is that this is exactly the way how this liberal paradigm, which is based on competition, gets into your house immediately. And which you, which you create a, basically a tra uh, tragical conflict within in your family. So. Now from uh, this part, I want to make a short point to, because I would also promise that they would say something about this notion of freedom and uh, the rule of law, because I have also a background in, uh, in law. And what you see happening is that if you have uh, people who have to apply legal rules, but who do not have the, let's say, the more or less old-fashioned, decent character in which uh, people used to apply legal rules, uh, then the legal rules lose their value. Uh, and in that sense, they do not have um, any meaning uh, within the social context in which they should protect uh, citizens for invasion of the state. Furthermore, I've also, as a, as a lawyer, I've seen like, many cases in which uh, the lower trained personnel of youth care facilities or of sort small city guards who are patrolling around, the <coughs> around cities who have simply no awareness of the fact that these rules even exist. So even if you make the argument that sorry you are trampling on my human rights, it doesn't make sense to them. They simply do not understand it. And it also seems very plausible from Goldberg's perspective because if you want to think on the level of human rights, you have to achieve stage five of Goldberg. 
And one of the things that Goldberg shows in his theory is that you can only understand it if you are yourself on, are on stage four. But this is only that not everybody in the population is able to achieve that, and our educational system is not based on training people to do so. So you get really sort of disconnection that people are not able to understand the basic assumptions of the legal system, which more or less erodes the legal system from below. It's happened very dangerously because these are also people who do have uh, sometimes a qualification from the school where I work for. And so. Um, then, yeah, I would like to finish the uh, debate. Uh, in relation to an existential ethic, it seems that an ethic uh, regards a continuous uh, studying of a practical and rational freedom. Um, it furthermore seems to be a balancing act in both maintaining relations of love, friendship and work. And I have illustrated above the virtues of acknowledged dependence may foster such relations. And this is I not really done, but I think the talk will come too large and get too many topics if I would, so I leave it for another paper, yeah. <laughs> not all relations can either be characterized as relations of friendship. Um, and for those uh, relations that cannot be characterized as so, I think you eventually end up in some kind of heroic ethic. So, usually a liberal ethic or a virtual ethic will do in most situations, but sometimes you end up in a situation that is an outright conflict, and if you can behave virtuously or liberal in an outright conflict, you are simply going to lose. If you behave certain liberal principles, you cannot win from the other party. And if the other party does not show respect for the principles, they simply chop off your head. So, um, and lastly, I think what's very important, if you go with this idea that <coughs> uh, absolute choice uh, leads to many different kind of... Uh, forms of life on which we cannot say what they should do, uh, is that you end up in a different conception of morality. In, within national, international law, they resolve this by saying, well, what well, we consider morality are not moral principles or rules, but we rather consider the debate about them is a form of morality. And I think then again, from start, have no problem, because you don't need any uh, steady internalized values or rules. You can simply say, well, we have different opinions, um, we can discuss about which rules we think should be uh, maintained and which uh, may be forgotten. And so that was basically what I wanted to say. Thank you.